this thing started. So uh, I'm Jameson Lopp. I'm an infrastructure engineer at CASA, or I have been for a couple of weeks now. Spent the past three years as an infrastructure engineer at BitGo. Uh, one thing that these two services have in common is that they're both non-custodial, multi-sig solutions. BitGo being a two of three, and CASA being a three of five. And so I've, uh, I've been in the Bitcoin space for six or seven years. I've been doing it full time for three years uh, with various non-custodial solutions. And uh, it's pretty easy for me to pick up new Bitcoin hardware and software and start using it. But really what I'm trying to get, uh, get at at this talk is that we need to be designing this software for newbies if we really want to grow the ecosystem and bring it to a mainstream audience. And it's a lot easier, in my opinion, to do that as a custodian. But if we really want to fulfill the promise of Bitcoin so that the average person can be their own bank, uh, we've got a lot more challenges ahead of us. So I've, I've been in the trenches for a number of years now. I've seen some crazy stuff. I've seen users lose money in more ways than I could ever imagine. In fact, I've seen people turn multi-sig wallets into what are effectively single-sig wallets. I've seen users get frustrated by inconvenient security policies, turn them off, and subsequently lose millions of dollars. I've met countless individuals who choose to leave their crypto assets with a custodian because they don't trust themselves to use a hardware wallet correctly. In fact, I was just talking to someone in the lunch break earlier who told me that they knew an engineer who had been in the Bitcoin space for seven or eight years and had lost their money so many times that they're actually you know, keeping it uh, with uh, a trusted family member just at their house. And now this person you know, does not want to try to go through all of the trouble of securing their own assets because they've seen highly technical people lose their money so often. So Bitcoin itself has a really high learning curve. It can take years of operating in the space to actually pick up on some of the best practices. And I've seen newbies come into this space and they just you know, treat it like a new API, a new platform. They don't actually understand all of the restrictions, all of the, the weird low level rules that are gonna prevent you from doing certain things on the network. So I've seen API users spam the network with dozens of transactions per second, even though it can only really support a few per second. Um, I've seen people come in and just hard code their fees on transactions knowing nothing about fee markets, and thus, of course, result in, in fees getting um, low fees and transactions getting stuck for a long period of time. Um, and in fact, depending upon a user's transaction patterns, they're gonna have completely different needs for how they do the UTXO selection and, and management of the data inside of their wallet. So you, you actually have this Goldilocks zone of UTXOs, you know, the real Bitcoins, if it were. And if you have too few or too many, then bad things start to happen. The wallet stops working in, in the way that you expect it to. And so we have uh, a number of, of different uh, problems that, that people run into, and even, even something as simple as the balance where you might look at your wallet balance and it might say you have one Bitcoin, but in fact, under the hood, you might have 10,000 different UTXOs with tiny little amounts of money and it will cost you enough in fees that your real spendable balance is not one Bitcoin. And, and even if you, if you have, for example, a lot of unconfirmed uh, deposits into your wallet, you shouldn't really be counting those towards the balance either. So wallets that, that don't pick up on all these differentiators can in fact confuse users and make them think that uh, they have a you know, different amount of value than they actually have. So it's very easy to achieve a high degree of security on your crypto assets. I advise people for the best security to just generate a private key, send your money to it, and then throw the private key away. That way, no one will ever be able to get to those Bitcoins. On the other hand, it's very easy to achieve a high degree of usability in a crypto wallet. All you have to do is create a web page. Just put the private key right there in the web page. Let anybody who wants to spend from that money, they have direct access to it. Very easy to use. So obviously, you know, we're trying to find some sort of sane equilibrium here. And the challenge, I think, that non-custodial wallets face is this root of trying to find the balance between security and ease of use. Because when we're building non-custodial wallets, we're giving up a lot of control to, um, of the wallet operation to the user uh, because we want them to have a better and stronger security model. And once again, you're trying to fulfill the be your own bank promise. 
The downside is that now the user has a ton of responsibility. And non-custodial wallet services are struggling with trying to, to help the users get over that high learning curve, uh, trying to get them to understand all of the best practices because we don't want them to shoot themselves in the foot. In fact, uh, in, in an earlier talk, uh, I think uh, the, the block side talk, he showed you that graph of all the people over the years who have accidentally spent uh, tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of dollars on a transaction fee. It's a, a very, very simple misstep like that can be very costly. So looking at private key security, there's a lot of different trade-offs. If we're talking about single SIG of, of uh, non-custodial where the user has it or custodial where some uh, third party has it, there are uh, many different types of malware that are out there that are trying to steal your keys off your devices. Uh, that's become a real big problem for users. Hacks, of course, always a big problem, though I would argue that they're a bigger problem for custodians because you're creating a honeypot. You're centralizing a lot of money in one location, so a hacker only really has to get into one uh, hot wallet to get a much bigger payday. Uh, weak passwords, of course, are a problem because um, not many people want have software to, to handle their passwords for them. They just memorize a few passwords and use them. And the same uh, password all over the place. Uh, end of life problems are really tough because you have to figure out both legal and technical implications of how to pass along those private keys. Uh, data loss, bigger problem on users because very few people are, are really IT savvy. And in fact, uh, the conversation I had earlier, you can be highly technical. You can understand how these systems work to a T, but still be lazy enough not to back up your data and, and you end up losing it. Um, so I recommend setting calendar events to actually check your wallets every now and then. Forgotten passwords, once again, a problem mainly for people who don't use uh, password managers. Uh, coercion. Hasn't been a problem until recently. Now we're starting to see more kidnappings, thefts, actual physical real world violence uh, being threatened against more public figures. And of course, with uh, custodians, any number of things that could happen that cause like that company to cease operating uh, that could, of course, result in you not being able to access their service. So when we, we try to use multi-sig, uh, like I said, both BitGo, Casa, and other services, use multi-sig to try to get rid of a lot of these problems. And um, especially when you have like one key that's held by a, a security service that specializes in, uh, in holding offline recovery data, that can help you with a number of these like end of life and data loss, other problems. And really we can, we can get rid of almost all of them except for the problem of the humans themselves. The weakest part of these non-custodial systems always ends up being the humans. Um, and engineering against physical and social attacks is really an entirely different problem set. So uh, when we're doing multi-sig wallets and we're spreading out keys over many different computers or hopefully even many different geographic offline locations, we can't completely get rid of coercion, but we can make it really, really hard because you'd have to travel all around the world potentially in order to get uh, enough private key data to reconstitute and make a valid transaction. And so really I say the biggest problem is of course phishing and scams of if, if a human has had their brain hacked to the point that they're like, yeah, I want to send some Bitcoin to this address because someone promised me something, then there's probably no level of, of technical sophistication that you can have that would prevent against that. Getting, uh, without getting too deep into the weeds now, like there's a number of just other things that go on under the hood. I kind of talked about how you can, you're looking for a Goldilocks zone with UTXOs. Uh, when you're creating a new transaction, you, you want to be able to arrange the internal data of that transaction in a way that optimizes for certain things. And to my knowledge, the vast majority of Bitcoin wallets out there don't really offer flexibility around this and don't even ask the user what it is that they're trying to optimize for. Um, a lot of them are probably very naive and are just uh, selecting the oldest UTXOs or the, or the UTXOs that uh, result in the smallest number of inputs. But those can all have a number of different bad trade-offs that we've learned about more over the years as uh, 
as we end up having like higher volume, larger wallets. I know there, uh, there were some wallets that I saw over the years that actually had hundreds of thousands of UTXOs in them. This uh, presents a very interesting selection problem because you, from a computer science perspective, can kind of consider this a, uh, uh, a bag problem uh, of, of trying to, to find uh, the knapsack like the, that has the, the exact specific uh, best value match. And I, I will say that, uh, shout out to Mark Erhart and his branch and bound algorithm, which he actually wrote his master's thesis on a few years ago. He implemented it at BitGo and uh, then helped uh, Andrew Chow actually get it into Bitcoin Core. That was nearly a year long process. I think it just got merged a week or so ago. Uh, other than UTXO stuff, there's transaction uh, fee estimation. This is not a graph of transaction fee estimates. This is a graph of the divergence of transaction fee estimates between different estimators that are available. So like, there's not even really a lot of consensus around what the heck is going on with the fee market. So if you choose uh, one fee estimator over another, you might end up paying a lot more. And uh, really another thing is that Users don't really, I think, think about the priority, like how fast do you really need something confirmed. It seems to me that most wallets are defaulting to like a, a two block, you know, pretty high, fast uh, confirmation. And that is actually going to result in uh, larger swings, uh, more contention for uh, higher prices. And, and I think the, 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 the bigger problem than that is that, of course, because defaults are a very strong thing in any piece of software, it's the developers that end up choosing these defaults. And we're not necessarily asking the user what it is that they want to get out of the wallet. As a result, I think we have developers that end up skewing the fee market in certain directions because they are making decisions on behalf of the user. And of course, this applies to a number of things other than just fees. Uh, another neat little metric here. This kind of shows you some of the, the heat map of uh, cycles that happen in, in the fee market on a daily and weekly basis. And as far as I'm aware, there are no fee estimation algorithms that take uh, any of this data into account. Uh, most of them actually just look at trailing data, though we have a few that have started to look at the real-time mempool uh, fee data. So. Few users are security experts. Uh, we need to coach them and, and guide them into the right path for uh, best practices. And you can do that, of course, by simple uh, notifications in the UI or by actually enforcing different rules of, of how your software gets used. So the users, they're not gonna read any documentation. I spent a lot of time over the years writing documentation. No one ever read it. Um, really. They're, they're going to they're gonna use the software and just kind of fumble their way around through it. So you need to be proactive about uh, what is required to use your software. Uh, if we're looking at stuff like uh, password requirements, then if you make your password requirements insanely complex, that's pretty much going to guarantee that that's going to push them towards using some sort of password management solution. And also, we, just, we should not make any assumptions about the user themselves. Like, we should never have single factor authentication, especially nothing around a phone. Um, we've seen a lot of problems over the years, of course, with phone porting attacks, where if, if you're either doing any sort of account reset or, or 2FA through SMS, that is almost inevitably going to get compromised. And uh, we really prefer using hardware 2FA for everything that you can. Same thing kind of around data management. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting from the recovery seed perspective is that even if you have a hardware wallet, which is theoretically very safe, I think the securing of that recovery data itself becomes a real problem, mainly if your, if your threat vector is like nation state level. So a lot of these Hardware wallets will just give you a piece of paper and you write down your, your recovery seed on it and they'll say, oh, just put this in a safe place. But what is a safe place? I mean, you could put it in your house, but your house might burn down. You could put it in a bank, but uh, the bank might end up 
having uh, a rogue employee or their employees might be coerced by some sort of nation state actor due to some sort of investigation in which you may or may not be guilty, but it probably doesn't matter at the time. In fact, I think on, on Reddit we saw a story just uh, yesterday about someone who had pretty much all of their assets confiscated. The only asset that ended up not being confiscated was their Bitcoin. So. Uh, key recovery services can also help out um, you know, with that, that uh, data redu redundancy stuff. And um, I think that a lot of it, like I said, is just reminding the users. So one, one thing that I'm very happy about that we're doing at CASA is in fact uh, instituting this idea of a health check so that you're actually gonna get regular reminders that you need to prove that you still have these various hardware devices. And if you don't prove every so often that you still have the device by signing a message with it, we're going to annoy the heck out of you, possibly even disable you from doing anything else with the wallet until you recover and replace uh, those keys that you no longer prove you have access to. Uh, we also see some very interesting thing with the rise of all of these different forks. Uh, this actually was something that I saw, I think, in the Coinomi wallet, uh, which I thought was actually very user-friendly because it at least lets people be aware. Whereas in the vast majority of wallets, they might just display a, a Bitcoin address to you and, uh, and, or a Litecoin address or whatever and not warn you that you, know, you might accidentally be sending some other crypto asset that will get stuck on that chain. Now, you know, in a lot of these cases, this is technically not a total funds loss. It's usually just a, a major inconvenience, but of course it is possible to lose money if you do something like uh, send uh, Bitcoin Cash to a SegWit address. That's gonna be really hard to recover. Also, upgrading. Upgrading is great from a protocol standpoint if it's voluntary, but if we're talking about an application, it is a real pain. So while SegWit, it was great, it was a soft fork, it, it gave the rest of the ecosystem time to roll out, it was actually pretty rough uh, at BitGo because we were trying to convince our customers, hey, you know, we put all this time and resources into SegWit, and if, if you just you know, spend a few minutes to upgrade your SDK, you're gonna be saving a lot of money and helping the network scale and all this other stuff but almost nobody did it. We would send emails, they would go without any response. And even with some of our larger customers, what we ended up having to do was run our own analysis that basically said, look, run this command and you'll save $70,000 a month. That is what finally got some people's attention because you know, they were sending so many different uh, transactions that they end up saving so much space, they save so much fees that you, you talk a lot about game theory and, and rationalization and stuff in this space, but I think that game theory is highly overrated because you, you make assumptions that like everybody has all of the information. But the reality is you know, people are busy running their businesses and living their lives. They're not paying attention to all of that. And then of course we come back to the user. Uh, the weakest point in any of these systems um, there are some things that we can do. I was actually really happy at BitGo where we implemented what you could call a blacklist, but really all we did was we went out and we found the various malware, the clipboard malware that was you know, swapping out addresses on people's computers and, and put all of those uh, addresses into our database and that has saved people, uh, you know, unfortunate novice users, tens of thousands of dollars by preventing them from sending money uh, to a known scammer address. And user friendliness, uh, this is once again, just the problem of trying to get people to go in the right direction. Um, it, this is, I think, a larger problem that we, if we think of this as like a multi-generational issue, uh, users are experiencing culture shock, is that they're used to be, uh, being able to call up a central administrator for their service to unlock their account, to you know, fix any, any fraudulent activity, and we need to, impress upon people that this is a system uh, that rewards self-reliance and it punishes negligence and ignorance. And so I think that we can you know, get best practices into the software by requiring it. Like, as more people are using more of these types of software that implement best practices and require them to be more responsible, hopefully that will start to result in a paradigm shift at a, a, a higher level. So I think I've got like 60 seconds left to kind of rant through that all. But uh, if anyone wants to know about security in general or the, the challenges of, of running large enterprise software where 
the, the people are the biggest problem. Always hit me up afterwards, too. Yeah. Just shout it. <laughs> Small UTXOs uh, by age of the coins. And I didn't think that age had an effect on, uh, but I'm curious. Right, right. It doesn't anymore. It used to. But, uh, but like the naive way uh, of implementing UTXO selection is like a first in, first out type of thing. Um, you can also naively implement, implement it by just like looking for the largest value UTXO. Just spin that and create a change output. But you end up with really weird side effects from stuff like that that end up in a fracturing of your UTXO set into tiny and tinier and tinier uh, little pieces until finally you get to an edge case that very few wallets can handle correctly, which is the sweeping edge case. Trying to sweep all of the value out of a wallet becomes a really big problem when your UTXO selection sucks and has resulted in you creating all of these dust outputs that in many cases cost more money to spend than they're worth. <laughs>